This week's episode of The Horror Show with Brian Keene is brought to you by Beers and Fears, the haunted brewery. There's an abandoned building in northern New Jersey with a rich, haunted history. Ghosts, demons, monsters of all kinds. It was once an asylum for the criminally insane, a craft brewery, and most recently, a decrepit eyesore that should have been demolished years ago. A place where evil dwells, a venue that feeds on the souls of all who enter. It's five o'clock somewhere, but here it's always just after midnight. So come on in, have a drink. Just don't stay too long because here there is no last call. Beers and Fears, the haunted brewery, consists of four interconnected novellas by Chuck Buddha, Frank Edler, Tim Meyer, and Armand Rosamilia. Beers and Fears, the haunted brewery, is available right now on Amazon and also Kindle Unlimited. This week's show is also brought to you by AdamandEve.com, America's number one trusted source for all things in the bedroom. Stuff for her, stuff for him, stuff for couples, movies, massage oils, lingerie, vibrators, bondage gear, and so much more. When you make your purchase, use the offer code KEEN at checkout and get 10 free gifts. That's KEEN, K-E-E-N-E, at AdamandEve.com. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother for the- what part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over. No comment. The f- Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. Welcome to another exciting episode of The Horror Show with Brian Keene. I am John Erpensick. To my right, Matt Dandelion Wilderson. Hello. To his right, there should be Mary the Professor San Giovanni. Woohoo! Directly across from me, the walking, talking poster child of toxic masculinity, Brian Keene. Hello, John. And making his triumphant return to my left, Mr. Excitement himself, Dave Thomas. Yeah, welcome back, Dave. Thank you. I, I just I just want to say, uh, I agree with your schedule. That's when we'll deliver the ducks. Okay, yes, it's another exciting episode of fucked up shit Phoebe says at three o'clock in the morning because that was the other night. <laughs> That's a good one. I just, I don't even know. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I don't want to know. I I know that we should never have John do the intros on the show again. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's good to see you, man. Welcome back. Thank you. And John, it's good to have you here. John will be with us for several weeks, ladies and gentlemen. That's awesome. So uh, yeah. if you enjoy his dulcet tones. <laughs> I, I apologize in advance. You apologize in advance. And, and here's Mary sneaking in. Because you were going to wait for me and you didn't. I wanted, I voted that we wait for you. Oh, yeah. Was it Dave? It was Dave. It was, Dave. It was absolutely yeah, Dave. Yeah, well, you know, Mary, um, your hair doesn't matter. This is an audio only show. Baby. So I'm, I'm I holding. I do it for me. Okay. I'm holding an electronic microphone in my hand and you are dripping water on me. <laughs> Sit. Join <laughs> it's us. It's going to be a very exciting episode. <laughs> And will, it, you know, it is going to be a very exciting episode. Who will die episode. first? Um, <laughs> coming one. up later in the episode, uh, we have Publishing 101. Now, I know a lot of listeners out there, they like it when we have publishers on because they don't want to be writers. They don't want to be fans. They want to be publishers. So coming up, we have uh, a panel of experts. Uh, we have Jacob Haddon from Apocrypha. We have Lisa Vasquez from Stitch Smile Publications. Anna Hayward from Poltergeist Press. C.V. Hunt of Grindhouse Press, David Now Wilson of Crossroads Press. Like I said, just a, a truly expert panel. Also is uh, Armand Rosamilia. <laughs> <laughs> a whole bunch of experts. Yeah. And Amon. Burn. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. You had like an Endgame style credits roll yeah. of characters. Yeah. You're like, oh yeah, and then, yeah. And then Howard the Armand. Duck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we have that coming up. Um, 
a couple other things to remind you folks about. Uh, this weekend, August 30th through September 1st, is Creature Feature Weekend taking place at the Wyndham Gettysburg in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I'll be there. Mary, you will be there. I certainly will. John, you will be there. I will. Uh, so will Jonathan Jans, mm-hmm. Ronald Malfi, Kelly Owen, Robert Ford, Wesley Southard, uh, Summer Some- Cannon, and Asher Ellis. Yes. And, you know, not for nothing, Jans, you know, hugely popular writer, never, ever, ever, ever signs in Pennsylvania. This may be the only time he signs in Pennsylvania. So, you know, if you live in Jersey or Maryland or Delaware, or Virginia or Pennsylvania, Basically, you need to be in Gettysburg this weekend. Now, the real question, though, that listeners have, will Dave and Matt be there? Dun, dun, dun. So let's go to Dave first. Um, obviously, I am day-to-day. Right. I think I'm planning to go on Saturday. All right. Saturday only. We're going to talk about the day-to-day Oh, yeah, we're going to talk minute. about that, yeah. Um, Matt, what about you? Will you be there? My work schedule is not allowing me to be able to get in there. You just slipped that, in. I was going to say, that was almost Alex yeah, Jones. Yeah, you subconsciously, <laughs> when you're angry about something, you slip into your Alex Jones impression. I've been letting it go at work, too. So it's just, <laughs> like people call in, they're like, hey, I'm sick, I can't come in. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's aliens. Uh-huh. So the, the clockwork elves are not letting you go? Is that what it is? It's all that tap water you're drinking. <laughs> you have genitals the size of <laughs> raisins. <laughs> Better than grapefruits. <laughs> now, now, John, you've heard him do his Alex Jones impression, but now you're seeing it in person. That's not even the best. I haven't. I have, I'm out of practice. I haven't been on this show in like a month. Well, yeah. I, we've yeah. been. We, well, what? I know you came back. You're like, look, things. Matt. There's more important people here than you right now. So you sit this one out. <laughs> Week two comes around. You're like, I just oh. don't really feel like seeing you. So just stay home again. <laughs> No, we didn't record a week no, I'm too. Just <laughs> so, so you're here this week while I'm here. So obviously, I'm not more important. Oh no, you are way more important. So there are that. other more important people <laughs> that you would be shunned. It for. was Coop. It was Coop. We, we were at uh, John and I were at KillerCon in Texas, and Dave Barnett from Necro Publications, who, uh, of course, he was the Splatterpunk Award Lifetime Achievement Award right. winner this year, um, and who we have a really good interview with coming up in a few weeks. But he. You know, Dave's like, oh, I listen every week. You guys never have coupon. <laughs> and and John, a reason yeah, John that. made the the noise he's making. I, I'm like, dude, we've had coupon like more times yeah. in the last four months than we've had Ever. them the entire yeah. five years we've been on yeah, the air. It's like a coop centered show. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I listen every week, but not really. <laughs> All right. Well, for <laughs> you know, he's the second person to do that in what, like, two weeks, where they're like, "You never have so and so on the show," and I listen every week. It's like, well, then you must not have listened last week because that's when we had that we had so and so on. They listen yeah. to the same episode over and over again. This show seems repetitive. I don't know, <laughs> but it, there there is something to that. People are discovering us all the time. Um, just uh, last week on Twitter, there was a new listener who started at the beginning. So they're listening to news that's five years old at this point, but yeah. they're they're working their way through. So um, I also there's also college kids listening. Just so you know, we're shaping young minds, as frightening as that sounds, but they're learning about the horror genre from us. Probably learn about Alex Jones from us. <laughs> <laughs> non Euclidean shapes. No, right, now don't shapes. do not trigger them. <laughs> I know in all college dorms, I've seen it. There are rooms where there is Play-Doh and knapsacks and juice boxes for them to for them to let loose their stress. Yeah, you don't want to trigger these kids. And they will come after you. I want to bring Elmer likes to cry out to the Play-Doh. Oh, no, not this fucker again. Alex. Coming straight from Pervert Street. Uh, <laughs> tell all the kids to get vaccinated. Oh, just yeah. need a hug, Alex. <laughs> let Elmo hug you. Yeah, that's not creepy. Elmo's going to hug you right now. Give me, a, give me a hug. Put a, put a, for real, put a fucking shirt on. For a, <laughs> yeah, you know what? Let me do that. Stall for me. That's yeah. visual for your listeners <laughs> now. Yeah. This is why it's only an audio Make show. It Elmo. Yeah. Right now, Brian Keene is 50% nude. <laughs> and that's 60% and we're not telling you which, too much. Yeah. Which 50%? 60% too much. Right. <laughs> The numbers don't lie. Elmo, but, yeah. but luckily, oh, your old pal Barty's here. Hi, Alex. <laughs> don't I have something important to do? <laughs> oh, right, Mary? Isn't there news or something? <laughs> there ought to be news. Good God, there right. ought to be news. If you are 
one of those new listeners who's just discovering us for the first time. We're sorry. You've probably already fled, but yeah. for the the one or two who stuck around, um, Dave has been sick uh, here for the last couple months, and Dave, uh, I know you announced it on Twitter earlier this week. Yeah, no, you couldn't save it for the fucking show. Damn you! I really, th- I seriously, <laughs> I thought about it. I was gonna, I was gonna announce this on the show and then just tell everybody, okay, you gotta listen to the podcast to find out what's going on with me, but I couldn't do that. Uh, no, I announced it on social media, but some other people know, and you guys knew, uh, I have been diagnosed with uh, cancer. Now, here's all the details I have at the moment, because I'm still seeing $98 million, and I need more tests. There is a tumor on my esophagus. And I think it is, as was described to me, because I've not seen any pictures, it's near where the esophagus meets the stomach. So I, I don't know where that is, like in, in this area somewhere. Uh, it's in your groin, right? Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's well, no, right here. yeah, it's right. Like right you can see where I'm yeah. pointing. Visual, yeah. visual, but it's like yeah, right yeah. under your audio, chest. Audio, yeah. Audio yeah. Only, so if remember. Dave had boobs, which is so what yes, you're so to. yes, so if Dave had boobs, it would be where the underwire is, probably. <laughs> okay, well that's interesting, but um, <laughs> I, I so scientifically speaking, so, it's the underboob. Some area, people yes. with 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 limited anatomical Are knowledge we? think boobs have underwire. I I know that. <laughs> I know uh, that too. you know there are people out there who ask this every week, but are we terrible people? I mean, the yes. man's trying to tell us about his cancer. Well, no, I'm just t- I'm we've terrible too. We've already gotten into boobs yeah. and underwire. You know why? Because we she love, started it. Because we, well, yeah, if it's <laughs> about boobs, of course yeah, I started it. So if there's but, anybody who's worse, it's her. It, it's oh my god! So. It's because right. it's really, Sorry, really it's horrible right. news, and you don't. You and we don't love Dave. Really I, I, that I, you know, I've, humor. I've been making fun of it because it's the only thing I can do. So anyway, there's there's the tumor. Uh, currently, the plan is for surgery, and followed by radiation and maybe chemotherapy. Which you never want the word radiation used in conjunction with your body. Like you just no. don't want to hear this because I'm like, well, this sounds awful. So um, I suspect, yeah. and I have not met with these doctors yet, but I suspect I'm going to get very sick from all of this, even worse than I've been, uh, because it's the side effects from side effects from radiation and chemotherapy. I don't know yet. I don't know any details. Uh, like I said, I need this other scan for they can determine exactly how big it is and all that stuff. So that's all the details I have. But uh, yeah, I've been sick for about a year. I've been in a hospital multiple times. I was in a hospital last week again. I got four blood transfusions. I suspected that something was seriously wrong with me. So when the, the doctor came in and said, you know, we found a tumor and we're doing a biopsy, I'm like, okay. Yeah, I, I, I figured there was something going on. So that was, uh, I went to hospital Tuesday, Wednesday, they found the tumor Friday. They did the biopsy results were back. So I've known about this for a week. Um, does it so. get frustrating? Cause yeah, you have been sick for a while. Oh now. God. Yes. And yeah. you know, you, you would see one doctor and they'd say, well, it's your diabetes. You'd see another one. They'd say, well, it's the medicine you're on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Turns out it was this all along. Does it get frustrating? Is it like you fuckers? Why didn't you catch this? Well, before now? I, there's a couple things about that. First of all, the, the part about the diabetes is absolutely frustrating because most doctors are fucking lazy. And then if they hear you're diabetic, everything can be blamed on a diabetic. Hey, a bear bit my arm off. Well, that's because you're diabetic, dumbass. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, that's how they are. So it was that. What, again, I've said on the show, my diabetes is under control. There's a number called the A1C that measures your, your – in your, basically, that needs to be under 8. Mine is a 7.2 or something like that. So that's, that's fine. Um so then they, you know, I have chronic kidney disease, which we talked about again in the show. Then that's the excuse for every issue that you have. But again, my kidneys are fine. The number for that, that they measure for that, it's fine. It's in range. My kidney doctor's happy with it. It's not that. Um, the problem with internal bleeding is that unless when they're taking pictures with whatever method they're using, unless it's actually bleeding right that second, they won't, you cannot catch it. So if it's like an intermittent bleed or it will bleed a little bit and it won't do it. Well, then they might not see it. So, um, and again, I don't know how long this tumor has been there or how big it's been. I, I haven't done a lot of information. The issue was, is they had not yet done an endoscopy, which is where they put the camera down your throat. I mean, they put a camera anywhere else in my fucking body. You'd think they would have gotten around to that too. But no, they finally did that in the hospital. And that's when they discovered this. Now, the good thing is, is that, um, you know, they, and I don't know exactly how they do this, but I guess there's some sort of instrument while it's in there. He, he, take some tissue off for a biopsy they also took tissue from all around my stomach that didn't show anything i was at a pet scan which um i had never had that before i got to drink two giant cups of awful liquid crap uh and get radioactive dye injected into me anyway that basically and again sometimes Jesus, i hope they use the offer code k-double-e-n-e at checkout at adamandeve.com when they bought 
all this equipment that they were using on them. I, I know. I, I don't think so. Oh, my. Because <laughs> it was not pleasant in any you th- way. You, yeah. <laughs> you think uh, it would have been a more enjoyable experience. No, not at all. So, but the, they, the doctors say stuff that sometimes they shouldn't say. And the, the guy's like, okay, so we're giving you this stuff. And then when we do the scan, if there's any other tumors in your body, it's going to light up like a Christmas tree. And I'm like, that's not not what, what you I really want, want to know. hear. You know, You're like one light. Yeah, <laughs> one, light. That's, that, that's, <laughs> one yeah. very yeah. dim light. That's yeah. not the superpower I want at all. Up no. like a Christmas tree. Oh look, so, there's 112 so, bulbs on this tree. So, <laughs> but anyway, the important thing is with the PET scan, they only saw the tumor. So well, that's good. Yeah. yeah. That, so supposedly, and it was a full body scan. So um, that's like I said, I have no further information at this point. I see a, a doctor today. I see one on Friday. Uh, at some point, I'm getting this this other scan done again, which is basically an endoscopy with an ultrasound. So that sounds delightful. Ultrasounds uh, don't hurt. No, no, no. It's it's internal. An internal ultrasound. Yes, yes. Oh, I've never had. That. I'll be unconscious, I, I, I so I don't really I care. That, yeah. So and uh, so I get the scan. I I have a coordinator already uh, because and she goes, oh, I coordinate anybody with GI cancer, and I'm like. How fucked up is our world that not only you need a coordinator, but you have coordinators for specific parts specific, of your body? Yeah. You know, it's just. Well, maybe that's maybe that's because uh, it's a nutrition issue, and she can help you. Like, well, it's she. Ba- and- her her thing is basically she coordinates all these different doctors because they all have their own little area of expertise, but they don't know everything. So she kind of has to get them all. Uh, the good thing about this is that I talked before about the uh, hematologist guy that I had. It was actually really good. Uh, he's also an, my uh, oncologist. Because that's his other job. So I saw him while I was in the hospital uh, before the biopsy results came back. But uh, he's kind of coordinating all of this uh, between him and my kidney doctor. Because, again, my kidney doctor is the one that sent me to the hospital. Well, this, this is the thing. She didn't send me to the hospital. We, we were setting up a trans, outpatient transfusion. And then uh, Phoebe and I went out for Phoebe's birthday. And we're sitting there in the restaurant. And I'm literally sitting in a chair. And I keep almost falling over because I'm so dizzy. So oh, I'm like, oh, we need to go to the ER. Yeah, I need a four units of blood transfusion. It's a delight. So um, I, that's it at this point. I, I don't know what else to say. Well, I, I know what to say. Um, fuck cancer. Yeah, yeah well, fuck, fuck cancer. Fuck cancer. Um, yeah. I'm, you know, uh, I mean, John, you know, you're here with us unexpectedly. You were supposed to still be in Spain, but, you know, you recently lost your partner to cancer. Uh, you know, Mary, your, your father had some stuff going on that luckily he got taken care of um you know uh and you know all the people in our industry are all our friends that we've we've lost over the last couple of years um yeah fuck cancer you know and you know Agreed. as much as we as, as much as we tease the millennials it's going to be one of them that finds a cure for it so keep in there college kids <laughs> we tease out of love uh, if all right, sh- if they're still on Earth, to- yeah, if they're yeah. still on yeah. Earth, yeah, yeah. <laughs> should we uh, should we go to the news? Because I know Dave's got a doctor's appointment today. <laughs> and, yeah. All right, um, is it breaking news? It, it it's it's good news. Um, oh. And actually, I was thinking the whole time because this is what a terrible person I am. I'm like, how am I going to segue from Dave's cancer to the news? And I just thought of a way. Uh, the 2019 Splatterpunk Awards. Award winners were announced. Um, the winner of the J.F. Gonzalez Lifetime Achievement Award was, of course, David G. Barnett. J.F. Gonzalez, of course, passed from cancer. That's why the award is named after him. It's flimsy, but we'll give it to you. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was heartfelt. I, I thought so. Thank you, Matt. I yeah. thought it, I thought it was a horrible segue. <laughs> <laughs> so you're 50-50. <laughs> Let's go to Dave. You're the tiebreaker. Uh, I, I zoned out. So. You zoned out. Yeah. Okay. It's my new, my new hobby. Uh, <laughs> I'm here to make he sure the listening. lights are flashing. Yeah. <laughs> you guys. Dave, we did, we did have you covered, though, engineering-wise. Uh, I told Matt, I said, you, you need to start learning how to do everything Dave does. <laughs> make all and, the lights look And pretty. Matt said, so drink Diet Coke and complain about things? And I said, no, you got to learn I how to. I did not say any of those words. <laughs> I, I, see, I know you didn't. I know that. Yeah, he's just trying to stir up trouble. Uh, no, he was. I took a picture of your soundboard, yeah. and I texted it to Matt, and then Matt found a YouTube video. About your oh, there's, there's 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 several. That hundreds. is the great yeah. thing about YouTube is it pretty yeah, much it teaches you anything, anything you want to know how to do. Like we used YouTube one time to fix the toilet in our house. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. we looked up how to do it, and it showed you. There's a guy like, oh, here's exactly what you need to buy at the store, and and, and we fixed it. And it's like uh-huh. you know, saved a couple hundred bucks calling a stupid plumber. That's know? what my you, dad. My yeah. dad uses it to to learn how to build stuff. All you the know time. what else you can find on YouTube? Brian Keen. Probably the 2019 Splatterpunk Awards. Um, best novel. 
Oh, <laughs> all right. That was a pretty good segue. That was a mu- much better segue. <laughs> that, that, I'll, I'll that give was, that one a that five was, out of that ten. That one was better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go for uh, that one. Best novel uh, was Full Brutal by Christopher Triana. That was published by Grindhouse Press. Best novella, uh, competing against himself. The winner was Brian Smith for Dead Stripper Storage, but he was competing against himself there, so it was a toss-up. <laughs> uh, that was also published by Grindhouse Press. Best short story was The Sea Creator by Ryan Harding. Uh, that appeared in the Splatterpunk Forever anthology. Best collection went to DJS Stories by David J. Scow, published by Subterranean Press. And best anthology was Splatterpunk Forever by Jack Bantry and Kit Power as editors. Uh, that was published by Splatterpunk Zine. So congratulations nice. to all the winners. Um, I said Grindhouse did do pretty bad. Grindhouse did like, real well. Good. And I'll tell you, um, you know, I'm I'm not a judge, but I oversee. You know, I, first of all, I oversee all the the reader picks, and then I oversee the judges' deliberations and their votes. Um, now we know who every one them. of these categories was super tight. So if you wow. didn't win. Uh, take solace in the fact that it was an incredibly tough decision yeah. in every category. Uh, best novel, for example, came down to one vote. Um, you know, it, 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 it every every category was tight, wow. uh, which That's is deservedly so yeah. because there was a lot of good stuff published yeah. last year. And apparently, they had no mechanism to determine what to do in the case of a tie. So next year, starting next year, apparently, it's going to be thumb wrestling. Thumb wrestling, yep. As it should be. Yep. As it should be. I, I have a question. <laughs> I um, want to see that. It's kind of a stupid question, but how does one nominate stories for that? That's a good question, Mary. Thank you. Uh, one emails their nominations. Uh, you, if you go to the KillerCon website, uh-huh. there's an email address you can mail them to. Okay. Okay. Um, if I'd known you were going to ask me this, I would have prepped and had that email address here for the air. I'm sorry, but, but it's on the website. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, you send your nominations in, and then I fact check. I look to make sure it qualifies. Uh, you know, if it's a novella, does it meet the word count? Uh, was it published in the qualifying year? Right now, the only thing you could nominate are works published in 2019. So if right. somebody reads Edward Lee's Dahmer's Not Dead for the first time, oh, I'm going to nominate that for a Splatterpunk Award. Well, no, you can't. Right, cause because it came, it came out in the early past. 2000s. Right. Um, once I've verified all that, I just keep track. Okay, and then I have somebody who fact checks me. Uh, you know, we have a, an independent person who fact checks me just to make sure I'm not up to any shenanigans. Um, at the end, you know, when we close to recommendations from readers, mm-hmm. uh, we then tally up everything. And, you know, the four or five in each category, which got the most reader recommendations, they go on the preliminary ballot. That ballot then goes to the judges. Ideally, The publishers will then send the judges a copy of each of those works. The judges will read them if they haven't already. Mm -hmm. Nice thing about our judges is most of them are, not not, not most of them, all of them are very well read. Uh, So, like, for this year, they had read most of these works before they even made the ballot. That's good. So, yeah. That's good. Um, So, you know, the judges then, they read everything, they deliberate, um, they give their first pick, their second pick, their third pick. Uh, Rath and I then tally everything um if there's a tie and mm-hmm. if there's still a tie with wrath and i involved uh you know we we have you thumb wrestle well yeah then then it comes down to the thumb wrestling that john mentioned gotcha uh but yeah it you know i don't i don't want to give away everything because right. you know uh you don't see the shirley jackson awards or the stoker awards or the wonderland book awards giving away everything we're not going to do that either but i think we are probably the most transparent of the horror literary awards um and it's working so far yes so yes you know now when we grow and we're charging a hundred dollars you know and for chicken cordon bleu and and we have you know <laughs> edward lee in a tuxedo up there giving you know i'd like to see a that speech not, like not my that. chicken cordon bleu i didn't make this chicken cordon bleu because <laughs> for that it would be worth the hundred dollars <laughs> <laughs> there you go i will give you an exclusive for next year's awards next year's lifetime achievement award winner uh you know first it was david j scow this year it was david barnett Next year, we're doing away with the David theme. I was going to say. Next <laughs> year's award winner will, in fact, be Edward Lee. Aww. So there you have it. It's exclusive. <laughs> if you want to see Edward Lee get his Lifetime Achievement Award, Aww. Killer Con 2020. Do you think he'd so, wear a tux? I don't think he'd. I think, I think, think Lee might clean himself up for that. Yeah? Yeah. Aww. 
come in looking like a hobo. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, you know I love you. All right. Well, if you guys don't have anything else, uh, like I said, I know Dave's got a doctor's appointment today. We want to get him out in time for that. Anyone have anything else? Well, I've been here. I've been coming here for years. I've been in this studio many, many times, times before. And I think I've just now noticed the little chef guy up there on the shelf. Oh, yeah. He's from... He, he's yes. from Kansas City? No. Or is he from Baltimore? He's from Baltimore. Baltimore. He's, um, he's from Horrifying. We did a har- the second Horrifying convention in Baltimore. Weston Oaks and Drew Williams, and I don't know who all else was involved. All of us. All of you? Everyone. Yeah, you guys huh. stole him from the hotel <laughs> restaurant and gave him to me as an award because, you know, it was it was only the second convention I'd ever run. This, this year's Scares the Care was... Jesus, what, like my 30th convention that I, that I have helped At organize? Least. But that was my second, and, and I was losing my goddamn mind. And, yeah, all of you presented me with that very fine award <laughs> yes. that was, you stole from the hotel, yeah. and I still have it here. It was, it was heartfelt. So, we yeah. meant it. I, we, it's we still, meant it. it's still one of my favorite ounce, awards. Every ounce of our being. Uh-huh. Meant it. I should do a video about that every, every ounce Maybe of alcohol will. that was in their bodies at the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's... that's uh... Speaking of things and bodies, we just want to remind you, uh, this week's show is brought to you... Giggity. ...by our dear friends at adamandeve.com. Remember... <laughs> They are America's number one trusted... Wait, what? I said a hell of a segue. <laughs> it has been the show for for magical segues. No, they're America's number one trusted source for sex toys. What do you do with sex toys? Some of them... What do I do? Some of them, you what? Play sex. With? You do sex. You put them in your... sex. Some of them do sex. You put them in or on your body. That's true, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And the best way to do that and save money doing it <laughs> is to use my last name at checkout. At checkout, just type in K-double-E-N-E. I just feel like that needs to be a quote in a book somewhere. John Urbansick, 2019. What do you do with sex toys, Brian? You sex them. <laughs> you do sex with them. You do you sex, sex with them. them. <laughs> and when you're not doing that, you drink beers. As in Beers and Fears, the new anthology from Chuck Boo to Frank Edler, Tim Meyer, and Armand Rosamilia. Beers and Fears, the Haunted Brewery. It's available right now on Amazon and also on Kindle Unlimited. Speaking of Armand, uh, let's go to that panel right now and learn all about how to become a publisher, and then we'll catch you on the flip side. So welcome to Publishing 101. My name is Armand Rosamilia. I am not a publisher. I was years ago, and I thought that was crazy, so I stopped doing it. <laughs> but um, So we're going to kind of do the the positives, the negatives, the everything about publishing. Uh, we'll go right down the list, who you are, what your company is, how long you've been in, and we'll kind of go from there. Um, I'm Lisa Vasquez. I am the CEO of Stitch Smile Publications. We have been uh, alive, or not alive, for uh, since 2015. We do dark fiction in a span um, across anything that's, that can be considered dark, be dark fantasy, dark sci-fi, um, horror, crime, anything under that umbrella, and that's a little bit what we do. <clears throat> I'm Anna Hayworth, and I run Poltergeist Press, and we launched in January, that January 2019. We have two divisions, one of them is Russian, so it's translating from English into Russian and then publishing it and selling it in Russia and worldwide. And uh, the love child of all of it is an English edition. So we do some imprints and hardbacks and uh, we started to do exclusives as well. And, um, you can pick up some books from Aaron Dries <laughs> and Matt Hayward <laughs> and Bob Hort and look for yourselves how pretty they are. <laughs> Uh, my name is C.B. Hunt. I run Grindhouse Press. Um, it was founded in 2009 by Anderson Prunty. I took over in 2017. Uh, we publish anything from like dark fiction all the way to extreme horror. Um, I'm Jacob Haddon. I run Apocrypha Books. Uh, we have been around since June of 2012, and our primary is Lamplight Magazine, but we also have several other publications. Um, David and Yael Wilson, we've been doing Crossroad Press since about 10 years ago. I think it would be 11 soon. Um, we do digital and audio and print of just about every genre, but we started with mostly horror because I used to be president of the Horror Writers Association. That's the people I knew when we started. Um, we've brought back hundreds of out-of-print horror, horror books that were just in people's garages, and now we're doing a lot of newer stuff. And 
Um, about 2,300 titles now, 700 audio books nice. and growing. <laughs> so we'll start with David. How, how did you get into publishing and were you a writer before or how did, how did it kind of work for you? I, I was a writer before and I'm a publisher by accident. I never wanted to do it because way back I did a magazine called The Tome and it's a lot of work and mm -hmm. it just was eating up all my writing time. So I wrote for years and years and years in books and then I wanted to do ebooks. But I'm also an IT manager, so I knew how to do the ebook. And a bunch of my friends were like, well, can you do that for me too? And I'm thinking, well, not for free. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we kind of came up with a new, I think it's a new concept. We pay almost all the money we make to the authors. Um, it's 80% of everything we make on ebooks. Because all the work's up front. Once you've made the ebook, it's just mm -hmm. split the money. And uh, it just started to grow and, and grow and grow. And then my business partner, David Dodd, has a huge paperback collection. And he made contact with more and more authors, and then people just started pouring in, and here we are. <laughs> and I still don't have any time to write. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not encouraging. <laughs> um, I bought Apocrypha.com uh, at the tail end of 1999. Um, it was going to be a role-playing book company, uh, because I was young and delusional. <laughs> um, uh, but then I grew older and a different kind of delusional and decided it was going to do um, horror stuff. And uh, finally, uh, when I decided to make Lamplight, really what it took was making the, the name. It was originally called Showcase, which is a horrible name for a magazine. But I was really excited about it. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I am a writer. I write as well. Um, at least I, I used to write. I had no time to write, so I started a publishing company. Um, which <laughs> prevented even more than that. Um. <laughs> uh, well, I started out as a writer, and then um, Anderson had uh, two presses, plus he was a writer, and he was considering closing one, <coughs> and I just could not let Grindhouse close, and I knew that there were a lot of good writers out there, and I kind of wanted to see them have their books in print, so uh, I just kind of took it over as uh, the love of it, and uh, definitely my writing has slowed down <laughs> since. <laughs> I'm a music teacher and um, I started as a fan and the idea of Poltergeist Press, the translating horror publications came when I did not find any of my favorite English or American authors in Russian. So I decided that I'm going to build a bridge, so to speak, and bring everything that is out here for Russian readers. Nice. I'm building an empire. <laughs> 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 yep. <laughs> um, so my story is I started out as a writer and what I did was um, I went and tried to intern or talk to other authors who were in the business and more better and had more experience and I decided that my foot in the door was that um, I do graphic uh, design and things so um, a lot of times when you're talking to somebody who has a lot of experience they've heard the same questions over and over again so I thought what can I do to set myself apart and so what I did was I went to them and I talked to them and I offered to do something for them and that gave me a lot of insight that you probably wouldn't get because you don't know the questions to ask sometimes until you ask them and so when you can get an author who has a lot of experience to talk about their experience and what to stay away from uh, and you're on a more intimate level of helping them create a book cover for their book or you're helping them to set up a web page or a WordPress um, you know I, I started out talking to Mark Tufo he stall cup and then got into the HWA and started talking to um, you know everybody in there uh, fangirled over Jonathan Mayberry and watched him you know just grow out of control he's an amazing guy so I wanted to pass that on to other authors that were coming to it had no idea what to do uh, no idea how to brand no idea how to <coughs> talk to other people no idea how to engage their readers and so our company is more of a mentoring teaching company and it's for veteran authors who maybe need a little refresher on that and for new people coming in uh, to learn the business and either grow and spread wings or stay with us. So, so who here is, um, I mean obviously we're, we're talking about publishing one-on-one, -on -one, so who here is thinking of maybe 
going into publishing themselves or any any of that type of thing? Way in the back. <laughs> <laughs> or what about publishing your own stuff? Hmm? So for you guys, what what's some of the, the I guess the pros and cons of advice for people who are thinking about creating a publishing company, maybe not necessarily a, the self-publishing, but also working with other authors as well. I'm going to defer to you because you've been in this way longer than the rest of us. <laughs> um, I think as a publisher and from what I've seen, because a lot of our authors were with other publishers over that decade and more and ended up with us because of you know enterprises that didn't make it. I think it's really easy as a, as a new publisher to <coughs> overextend yourself and promise a whole lot of people you're going to do a whole lot of things, particularly if you don't really know how to do those things in the first place. Um, you go out and start paying people who know how to do them and you find out how much money it's actually going to cost and it can be really, really eye-opening. So I would say the thing is to make sure you've got the money up front to do the first couple things you want to do and <coughs> make sure you have every aspect of it covered, the graphic design, the interior design. Editing is so important, and uh, there's so, there are way too many people out there that have editor written right next to their name <coughs> that couldn't write a grammatical sentence to save their lives. So you have to be careful. You have to ask people, get good advice from people that have already done it, and move slowly. And I, I think almost anybody in this in this environment that sticks with it can do a good job publishing. A lot of the a lot of publishing is technical. A lot of publishing is nothing to do with, I mean, I'm not dismissing at all the fact that you need to know how to write a, a sentence. Um, believe me, um, you need somebody um, somebody involved in the process. But uh, a, a, an ebook is an HTML document wrapped in a zip file, right? So can you write a CSS uh, script on your own? Because you might have to, because uh, whatever you need to format in that, in that, that book is going to tweak itself wrong until you actually go in there by hand and fix it. Um, whether... You know, the big way to publish things right now are print books, ebooks, and on websites, and two of those three involve intimate knowledge of HTML and CSS, right? So the idea that if I'm good in English, that's all I really need to know, um, it isn't going to get you very far. There's a very, there's a highly, there's a technical side of it. You're not going to be able to rely on InDesign to do everything for you. Um, the good news is, is the amount of time it took you to learn InDesign, it takes less time to learn HTML. It takes less time to learn to do a lot of this stuff by hand. So make sure that you're being focused on sort of the end of what you're trying to do rather than whatever flashy program or whatever flashy thing you think is, is an industry standard. Um, I'm definitely not on the deep in industry, but it's my experience that unless it's Photoshop, there isn't an industry standard for just about anything. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say if you're starting it and you're a writer and you think that you're going to be able to keep your writing schedule, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're going to have to make like sacrifices to um, your authors. Uh, my biggest thing has always been communication, letting the authors know what's going on, uh, being organized, being, in, um, you know, as simple as I've seen things where people upload wrong files. Like, you have to be organized. Um, and communicate with your authors like that's the biggest thing for me um, and as far as like communicating too it's like not with just the authors other publishers um, you know if you see a book cover you like you ask that publisher like who's doing your artwork like things like that you just have to keep uh, networking <coughs> well I can share the experience of translating and then publishing and um, if you do anything your hobbies, you forget about them. Uh, to publish a book it takes a lot. You have to be organized, you have to format well, you have to um, space out your book so you have enough time to promote it because you can't expect an author to do it for you, you have to do it yourself. Networking. And you have to keep in mind where is your goal. I would say so. Whenever you have a bad day, or you're tired, you have to remember where you're going. So that's going to be your kind of balance. So that is to add to everything that people said before me because what they said is absolutely true and correct. Mm -hmm. I think for me, the, the add-on, because we're a mentoring and, and teaching company, uh, you have to remember that 
nobody else is on your level. So when you're explaining something, I always try to break it down into a simple explanation that's concise that they can understand but doesn't patronize them. And so you're talking to professionals, you're talking to adults, but um, the main thing that I would say is to always stay humble and don't be afraid to ask other people for help. Don't be afraid to ask other authors, other publishing companies. Um, you know, I, I constantly will go to Brian Keene and ask questions or I'll go to other people and say, hey, I, I need help because I know I'm not the only one out there and my only concern is to uh, uphold my name. My name's on that, you know what I'm saying? So if you're gonna put your name on it, be honest and true to yourself, but be honest and true to the people that you're representing. Uh, I'm very upfront with them. I, I Every author that comes in, uh, Armand can tell you, I have a full-blown conversation with them. I want them to ask me questions. I want them to challenge me. And I want them to be sure that I'm the person that they trust with their work. Because if I'm not, then I will have no problem telling them, maybe we're not the company for you. Mm -hmm. This is what I expect from you. What do you expect from me? And can we work together? I've never talked to Lisa before. <laughs> <laughs> so for a, for a, an author that comes to you that submits you guys have an open submission period whatever and they come to you what are some of the things I guess what are some of the things that you wish an author coming in who who obviously likes your company enough that wants to work with you what what are some of the things that they realistically need to understand about your process about your your publishing and about the reality of <coughs> the chance of them actually getting published with you? Um, for me, it, uh, we have a motto in our company that's, um, do you want it right or do you want it right now? So all, there are a lot of companies that you can go to and they will publish things within a couple months of you handing it in. We don't do that and I tell them that flat out. If you're looking to publish it fast, we're not the company for you because we go through a grueling process and even Stephen King listens to his editor. <laughs> so um, when they when you hand in a story to somebody, remember it's gonna it's gonna bleed. You're gonna see a lot of red on it. Um, and I totally agree with, uh, with with you back over here that you need an editor. There's n even people who are an editor will not edit their own work. So never trust it to somebody who's like, well, I was really good at English when I was in high school or college or anything like that. Uh, our company started out with interns. So I went to several colleges and I said, give me people who want to do publishing for a living and I'll give them real life experience. And that's what we did. We gave them real life experience. And I can tell you honestly, two of them didn't continue in that program. <laughs> uh, we don't have open submissions. Uh, <laughs> books have been written. <laughs> um, that's it. <laughs> Ed editors are important. Yeah, for sure. I had four. Now I had two. Since we've been on only since January, uh, I had a few translators working and few editors, and I was seeing who is doing best, mm -hmm. so I could keep only the best and concentrate on what we're doing. That's it. <laughs> no open submissions. <laughs> Next. <laughs> uh, well, actually, when um, people send a submission in, um, if they get accepted, the first thing I do is I send them a welcome letter, and it is as transparent as can be. It tells them step by step what we are going to do and how we're going to do it. Um, the biggest thing, I think, for anybody like submitting to Grindhouse to know is like it's a two-person operation for the most part, except for the cover <coughs> artists and stuff. And we both have day jobs. So I do my best to treat them as if they are the only author on that press, but I mean, we can do so much, you know, when we have to clock in and clock out at another day job, so. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, short fiction, slightly different than longer fiction. Um, Lamplight has two submission periods a year and the reason why I have two submission periods a year is because I got a thousand stories each submission period of which I accept eight. Um, I will not do public math but that is unfortunately not very good odds, right? And which means that not only do you have a high chance of being rejected, you have a high chance of sending me an amazing award-winning story that is going to be rejected. Um, so my first comment on that is always 
Rejection doesn't mean your story isn't good. It means it wasn't right for me. So make sure you always keep that in mind. Um, I, I am not, I'm not kidding this. I easily reject a, a, at least a full second, if not a full third year worth of worthy stories every year from that slush pile. Um, and it hurts, it sucks. You see it go on and they do great things and you're happy for that, but you're like, I could have been doing great things in my magazine. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, but just something to keep in mind, right? Especially in short fiction, the numbers are working against you, right? So the way you do that is you just keep going at it. You keep submitting, right? And you keep working at it. Um, again, to go back to the slightly technical side, when you are formatting your manuscript for submission, you are formatting it for clarity, not for publication. And what I mean by that is, uh, you have to submit it so that when somebody's looking at it, I'm going to look at it and say, okay, you clearly mean that this is indented. You clearly mean that this is supposed to be italicized or, or emphasized, if you will, because I may not use italics for emphasis. I may use something else, right? I have a style guide for whatever it is the publication I'm in, right? So as boring as Shun's manuscript form looks, it is a very clear way to present to the, the publisher, this is how I want it formatted. You're still gonna go back and forth and we're still gonna go through page by page and make sure everything looks the way that we want it to, right? But just remember, formatting for clarity, not for print. That's my job. I will make your stuff look pretty, I promise. <laughs> Um, we also don't really have, we say we don't have any open submissions, but it turns out never to be true. But we, when we started, there's myself, my business partner, David Dodd, and my wife, who's a, an award-winning editor. And that's the full-time staff. And two of the three of us have day jobs. Mm -hmm. um, then we have a, a bunch of interns and, and editors we've worked with over time, and a lot of those editors have gone by the wayside after we saw what was turned back in. A lot of our books are just proofreading scanned books. We just picked up 40 or 50 books from White Wolf, the old publishing company, nice. and nice. had to scan those and read, oh my God. Because <laughs> <laughs> they were edited poorly to start with. Yeah. Yeah. And then on top of that, we have this. But um, what has happened over time is that you know some of our writers that we do trust have brought new people to us that we've never heard of or that never had a book out. In, uh, We've done a few anthologies. We don't mean to. We just did one with Craig Spector. I don't know if any of you remember him from writing with John Skip and the light at the end and all that. And we did take an open submission this year from F. Paul Wilson for the new Repairman Jack novel, which we're hoping is the big push for us. Because mm -hmm. nice. what we've been trying trying to tell you know some of the su successful writers is, if you get 80% from us and you get 4% from Tor, the odds are pretty good you're going to make more money from us. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and we got the audio book for that and everything too. So it, it's just important to look at what the publisher does and, and to understand that there's only so much they can do. And if you turn in a manuscript that's already a mess, the odds are it's going to be in an envelope on the way back before you even get it half read. So just your name's on it. If your name's on it, make sure it's something you want your name to be on. Mm -hmm. So for for uh, for you as a publisher, when you when you first started publishing, what are some of the challenges that you did not expect, or some of the things that kind of blindsided you in the beginning? That that's easy for me. I, mean, I never ran a business before. I mean, when it was just myself and ten other authors, it was a spreadsheet and it was easy to keep track of. But then we started distributing to all these different places, and then it came tax time, and there's 1099 forms to fill out and all this stuff and. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I'm really thankful to have had the business partner that I did because he's good with numbers, but he didn't really know how to do it either. Mm. So, you know, the things that blindsided me were things that you brought up where it's just not writing. It's not enough just to be a writer. You have to be able to do the HTML for all that. That's how I started. You have to be able to do the business side. You have to know someone at least who can do the editing and the cover art. And, and none of that is as simple as it seems. A lot of people think you just get a picture and you put some text on it. And I can tell you that I have tried to do that a thousand times and have succeeded once. And Dave can do it in an hour. So. Um, one of the things that, uh, that frustrated me, especially early on, is even when I am paying someone, their schedule is not my schedule. And so I can go to somebody with money and be like, can you do X for me? And they can say yes. And if my mag if the magazine is supposed to be out on Thursday, it doesn't matter if to them as much, right? So um, 
I rapidly became the point where even if I couldn't do it well, because I'm not a great cover artist either, um, I needed to be able to do it all, right? Which is an awful way to do business, by the way. Yes. It is awful to, have to do everything yourself. But it is good to be able to do everything yourself so that when something happens, you can go, okay, I can step in and, and fill that role um, and, and do that thing. So that was one of the early frustrations of even being like, but I'm not asking for it for free, right? I'm, I've, got, I've got money and you're not returning phone calls. I'm like, you're playing on Twitter that you're not being paid, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think for me the biggest frustration was just not realizing like authors personalities and how they work and sometimes you have an author who wants to take the wheel <laughs> mm. and make it their own and it's just like well that would be self-publishing um, but yeah it's just like the different personalities and you kind of have to like feel out people and just realize that you know they have their lives going on too so they're trying to do things and you're trying to do things and they have a very strict regimen of how they would write and how they would deliver that and like when you're someone who goes through you know the uh, proofreading within like a week's time and some people will just turn around and hand you their edits back in a day or like mm, you know, did you really do that? Or did you just go through and accept everything without actually reading it? Um, so it's just like, yeah, just getting the flow of just every time I take on a new author, it's like, okay, what is it gonna be the personality of this person? Hmm. I'm trying to think where to start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before the lounge in January, um, I was translating and organizing and planning for about half a year and that was the part when I was doing all by myself. Mm -hmm. Very hard, <laughs> very hard. Um, finding the right people to work it takes time mm -hmm. because you have to know them. So you kind of first of all give chance to everybody and then you see after some time with who you're going to stick and who is going to be your kind of your team. Mm -hmm. The editors were great. And then you don't see them for a month. Yes. <laughs> it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> but what can you do? People have some time, tough times. So have a backup. The best if you have a backup. Uh, that's good. What else? Um, even if you have written on your, I don't, I don't know. Since I don't really deal with authors that much, um, some other people, let's say fans, uh, started sending me their translations a lot, and they're like, let's publish that. <laughs> Let's publish that. You just buy the rights and you're fine. And I'm like, whoa! <laughs> you have to learn how to say no in this situation because yes. mm, preparing what book, let's say you translate it for about two, three months, but then you need to edit it. And I do double editing just in case. And then you have a cover and then you need to format it. And then you need to promote it. So after the translation is done, give it two months is perfect. I think three months. So there is no way you can fit anything else in because they want it now and fast. Let's say, oh, I have the book translated. It's like 150,000 words. It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so I learn how to say no because I'm very, very soft person. I'm like, oh, well, I might take a look at that. And I did it twice and I was like, no, I'm not never, never, never <laughs> doing it again. <laughs> so you have to be a bit tough if you want to yes. be a businessman, like, you know, managing people. I, I think to piggyback off of that, I think you have to... Um, know what you want and to be able to say no to, per to, to certain people that you normally wouldn't say no to. Uh, the pushback from the authors I think is the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. um, like you were saying, like that's self-publishing yeah. then at that point. You gave it to us, you trusted us, and now all of a sudden you're like, well I can do the formatting, I can do this. Now we're a teaching company so I do let them take the wheel in certain things. Um, I do try to teach them because that's what I do. Uh, but then at some point I have to say, but I'm still your publisher. I'm paying for it. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Um, and you, as the author, still have to promote your own work, too, because, again, we're a different kind of company we're teaching. So I'm teaching you how to do this so that you can go out and know what to expect and engage your readers, because I tell them they're, they, there's 20 books on the table. If you're standing behind the table and you're just one of the authors there, they're buying you. They're not buying your book. There's beautiful covers if you go through these hallways. Beautiful covers, great authors, so how are you going to make yourself stand out? And so, let your personality come out. You know, we have um, some authors that 
you know, have little little gimmicks for their stuff. So, you know, um, Tommy Clark has Good Boy. He's got little doggy snacks, and, you know, you'll see uh, A.J. Brown walking around. He's got his little bear. They're all their personalities, but I'm like, just be you or be who you uh, your persona is. I'm the Dark Queen, so I usually walk around. I have, you know, vampire uh, attire on. So, um, but that's my gimmick, and that's how I reach my fans, and that's how I relate to them. Um, the, I think for me the biggest frustration was not realizing how much money you really need. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're like, oh, well, it's free to upload to Amazon and it's free to do this. And, oh, there's a couple places that I can pay, you know, $200 for advertising. But how many books do you have? <coughs> how many times do you have to advertise a year? Are those paying back? Are they translating into sales? Why aren't they translating to sales? What keywords do you need? What hashtags do I need? What social media should I be on? All of them. Who's doing social media again this week? You know, uh, where's like you said, where's my editor? Um, and like they have lives, they have family, and so you've got to be ready to uh, balance about fifty plates in, in one day. I'm gonna yeah. have piggy tail back. Yeah, I would say it in Russian. <laughs> <laughs> Russian. <laughs> piggy tail back. <laughs> social media is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Like super, super important. If you can't do it yourself, hire somebody to do it for you. Mm -hmm. Be there maybe like, I don't know, once a week, good, two times a week, good. Whatever, whatever. Even if it's gonna be about little kitties or you find a funny picture, people will just keep their attention there that you were alive, so you kind of have to be there. Consistent. Yeah. Consistency. Right. Because now the world is shifting. It's still half of it is here and then half of it is there. <coughs> Pictures works really well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's another good piggyback for me. Um, there's also a frustration with me with marketing. Um, there's a lot of people out there now that are like services, we'll help you market, we'll get you in 10,000. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And there's at least a dozen people copying BookBub, which is probably the best ebook promotion out there. But it's hard to get, it's expensive, mm -hmm. and it works. And then the other ones that are like it are less expensive, but they don't work because they have 3,500, 35,000 people they're sending it to. Every one of them is another author who's trying to sell their book and they're not right. going to buy your book. So it's, yeah. it's smart to, to take your time on social media and spend it wisely. Mm -hmm. If you can't get the books in front of people that don't have any idea who you are, you're not going to make any new sales. I'll, I've got right. 4,500 friends and followers on Facebook and I guess 10 of them buy my books. Yes. But if I do something that gets me out there where people don't have any idea who I am, I can sell mm -hmm. hundreds. So it's important to make sure you get return <coughs> on the time and the money. Yeah. So do you feel like when you when you said that 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 really rang true with me because you know every single day on the on the social media you're on your Facebook you're on your Twitter and you you see a lot of authors that are just like here's a link to my book over and over and over, over and over again and do you know how many times how many times have any of you just gone like this and scrolled through stuff and it's like so why am I buying what, what again beautiful covers everywhere you may stop and look at the cover and go oh that's that's really that's, cool that's frustrating as an author I don't know how many times yeah. like on this cover here in particular mm -hmm. 150 people posted when I posted this new book mm -hmm. probably 125 of them said love the cover yeah and none of them bought it yeah exactly <laughs> so, so then you know you, you say that you sell when people don't know you it's you engaging them as you right, being exactly. it's being there and talking to to people about your book and, and authors need to learn how to do that and you have to be able to teach them in my position so <laughs> yeah. and I would add to that too it's um, I think a lot of new authors make the mistake of I'm gonna go to Facebook and I'm gonna add all these other writers <laughs> okay <laughs> that's fine you want to network with other writers great you can get advice and all that stuff but like when you start posting a link to your book every day these are not your readers right these are your co-workers mm -hmm. if you want readers to buy your book you should go look at Facebook groups, mm -hmm. groups who are reading horror books and stuff like that. Those are the people they want to see new books. They want to see links to books they've never seen before. Um, so the people just using, you know, the social media and thinking that, well, if I just post about my book nonstop <coughs> after I've added 5,000 writers to my list, <laughs> like surely I'll sell 5,000 books. Right. No, you won't. <laughs> right. Exactly. 4,000 at least. <laughs> um, and, and something that is, that is frustrating, um, at least from my perspective, hopefully I'm the only one on the panel who has this problem, but uh, from my perspective, um, 
for every for every bit of promotion I do, a tenth of that that the writer does is 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 a significantly more successful. Right? Mm -hmm. Readers do not follow publishers. Um, that's that's to some rarity. It, there are publishers who get followed, but for the most part, readers follow writers, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not fair, but it's the world now where we, as the publishers, need the writers to be engaged in that promotion side as well, right? Yes. You know, it's our job to help provide material. Okay, so here's here's the cover. Here's an Instagram poster. Here's here's some things to help you do what you're doing. But, uh, um, you know, I, I can spend, I, I, I spend like, Four hundred dollars promoting a book, um, and that got zero feedback. I had a writer post about it on Twitter twice. And we sold twenty copies in an hour. Right, like <laughs> it was one of those things. You're just like, I, this isn't fair. But it's unfortunately, it's an it's another unfortunate aspect of it. So mm -hmm. now, as as publishers, are you guys first off? Are you talking to other publishers about certain authors, and are you following? The social media and all that, because there's there's authors out there like like um, like I'm awesome. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> but like there's other authors that most of their posts are political or rants or fighting with other people and all that. And does that come into account when when you're getting those stories or those books are coming into you? Do you do you just go, let's look at this story in a vacuum and I love this story and let's publish this person, or is it hey? I know David worked with this person before. Were they a pain in the ass? You know, um, or I'm seeing all I'm seeing are rants and crazy stuff on um, on Facebook. So <coughs> maybe I don't want to work with this person. That's a, that's a really good question. I, I, I know it is. I, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think if they're uh, if they're causing problems and they're alienating their audience, um, I personally don't want to work with them. Um, I do ask other publishers and other authors, what do you think of them? A lot of the people that came into Stitched after the first year were um, friends of friends, or friends of authors, sorry, friends of authors that they recruited in and said, I like being there. Uh, of course, we have, we're not for everybody, and so we have authors that don't like us, and I tell everybody who asks me personally about my company, I tell them, ask my authors. Because I can sell you, you know, I can sell ISU, you know, an Eskimo, but what I need you to do is to talk to the authors who are your friends or who, are, who you know, who you follow, and get their their take on it because um, it, we're a family. We really are. We're very close-knit and we're very tight. As a matter of fact, this is our meeting ground. Uh, everybody comes here more and more every year. We get more of our authors that come into Scares That Care. Uh, but for us, it's... Um, you know, authors have to realize that you're. Yes, you have a publisher. They're not going to do everything for you, and if you hop from publisher to publisher and you are a diva, we do talk, and it's not about them in a bad way. But we may say, "How was it working with?" It's like any job. You go for a job and you ask for a reference. I'm I'm using these people as your reference, so we will say, "Well, you know, just." watch out, he may push back on the editing, or hey, watch out, um, he does have a very political, you know, social media or something like that, so, but we get really good feedback a lot, too. Well, since I translate, I'm, people are following publisher in Russia, That's so good. I That's kind good. of become this big author who has to do most of the job. <laughs> um, if I like the story, I read the book. Because I myself, I'm not really on the social media like personally, so as in like me, me, mm -hmm. not the Portuguese press. So, um, if the story is good, I'm going to publish it. I will translate it and publish it. And if I don't agree with some political views, I'll just never talk about it. <laughs> and if somebody will try to talk about it, we're gonna have a talk. Mm -hmm. I'll say we don't talk about it. We work on books. End of the story, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. What else was the question about? <laughs> <laughs> I zoned out here. I don't even remember. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, well, do you talk about to the other negative, negative social media and stuff. Well, yeah, or do you talk to other, talk to other publishers? publishers. Mm -hmm. To the publishers. No, I don't speak with the other Russian publisher. They're my enemy. <laughs> 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 well, uh, you know, I follow them, <laughs> but uh, we don't talk. No, well, we spoke a few times, but <laughs> <laughs> we're keeping the distance. <laughs> 
Uh, would the uh, would the English language publishers? Yeah, we mm -hmm. yeah yeah we'll talk. Yeah, mm. yeah, I definitely talk. I mean, as like, far as yeah, I mean, like why not to? Or, yeah, I mean, you if you want to learn more, you're going to start asking questions definitely. But I mean, no, I'd be talking probably only private. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> um, but as <laughs> far as like the social media, like you say, if you politically just yeah. And mm -hmm. I, I love that aspect, but I mean, we are, Grindhouse is so small. Um, I'm thankful that a lot of the authors that we publish, um, for the most part, kind of like self-publish before they come to us. So it is like them learning more from like this. And um, so I don't, I mean, I, but I would, if there was a, a uh, author that I wasn't really sure about, I would definitely ask. Um, but yeah, uh, this may not be a popular way of doing things, but when I get a submission in my inbox, uh, the very first thing that I do is I Google that person's name because <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like, oh, if it's a new it's, person, yeah, no, it's, you have it's, to. it's one of those things where I Absolutely. say like the personality clashes. It's like if yeah. I go to your social media page and it is just hateful, combative posts, I know that your personality is not going to match mine, right? And I'm probably going to go ahead and skip over your book. And I know that's probably not the greatest way to do things because there's probably a lot of really good books out there. But it's just um, I've seen small presses who have had situations where authors and readers and other authors are going back to the publisher and complaining and squabbling and. I tell people, I don't know how many times I've said this, I am not the author's mother. Mm -hmm. I am not going to get in the middle of that. Um, you know, that is between those people. Um, I've never had these situations before, but I've seen it before. So I try to kind of like stop that, especially on my end, just dealing with, you know, an, an author and how we're going to do things. It's like if I think the personality is going to clash really hard with, with me, it's like I will just be like, no. <laughs> I kind of like, try to avoid Save conflict in my now. life. <laughs> just yeah. like I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to be sitting there screaming at a computer all the time and, you know, <laughs> it's not the type of, like, you know, when the personalities start clashing or something like that, when you're like, I'm trying to do this, this is my press, this is my money, this is how I want to do it, and then, like, yeah, authors coming back and being like, no, no, this we're doing it this way. It's like, well, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, I do, I do take into account, like, if somebody has a lot of problems with yeah. people or um, just online, if I think that they're, you know, just combative all the time, mm -hmm. it's just like I will uh, just avoid <coughs> working with that person. So I have thankfully not had this problem. I got close to this problem a couple of times, but I have not had it yet. But yeah, I do, I do, I'm cognizant, I pay attention. Uh, the unfortunate aspect of, especially a press as small as mine, um, is that literally one one was it one bad apple, right? Like I could get somebody across my table, and they were like, "Oh yeah, but you remember who published that book, right?" And so um, you look at it; you have to be across. But that's it's not it's not just politics in the sense that I don't agree with this what person is saying, right? Is if you can imagine, like sort of like there's the the area at which we are allowed to argue about things, and then there's an area be past that, right? Mm -hmm. And are they going? Are they going into places where, right? This is this is hate speech. This is a problem. This is this is causing an issue. Uh, this is insensitive, racist. Uh, something something in here, right? Uh, I have more than once really liked the story and asked somebody outside to read it before I've accepted it to make sure I wasn't missing something, right? Mm -hmm. um, and people are like, well, if you liked it, why wasn't that good enough? It's like, well, because good enough from an editor standpoint is different from good enough as a publisher standpoint, right? I'm making, right I'm not making a, um, a judgment call. Um, this is not a contest. I'm making a business decision. Is this a story that I am willing to put my name behind? Um, and so again, thankfully, I've not had this problem. But yeah, I, you have to, you have to pay attention. Um, you have to be cognizant of that. Um, and you have to look at and I have published people who have very politically active politically combative presences in this world but they're within this sort of area of like no no that is something that you are allowed to have an opinion on right. and you are allowed to argue until you're blue in the face because you are not crossing some it's not an imaginary line but you're not crossing out into this something else so I don't I'm not trying to 
say don't be who you are but just remember who you are is is visible even if you have a friends only Facebook page right mm -hmm. so <laughs> yeah, I probably fall on the, the um, side of people that speak quite often about what they believe and uh, it hasn't really been a problem but we have had a, a few people that, that came to us to work with and my answer has always been um, like like you said my name's on this book and your name's on this book I can't get behind this I'm not enthusiastic about you or your book mm -hmm. it's not going to do you any good <coughs> for me to publish your book we have a uh, there was an author that was going to be in this book and then some of the way over the line stuff popped up and they aren't in the book yeah and uh, I don't I don't see any problem actually with a publisher who has a view of something like that where there is a line that's different from other people's lines mm -hmm. As long as you let people know up front, I mean, right. just be honest. It, we've we've had several people bring uh, very religious books to us, mm. and I have to tell them up front. I said, well, I'm not going to be enthusiastic about this because I'm not enthusiastic about that, and I don't want to say something that's going to offend you at some mm. point right. along the way. So probably this is not for you. Mm. And we've had some really interesting email because Crossroads Press is like a 20-year religious Catholic publication company. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we get email from monks wow. asking about their books. <laughs> <laughs> it's very confusing. I can't imagine what happens when they get our email. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I think we, I, we try not to push anyone. I, I don't really care what people believe mm -hmm. as long as they're polite about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the you politeness know? goes a long way too because it is one of those things like you don't want to think that an author behaving badly is going to reflect negative, negatively onto the press, right. but it does. It does. I've seen it time and time again. Yeah. I've seen authors go off the wall, you know, and it's just, yeah, that's why I say I'm not the mother because I've seen people just contacting the publisher, the editors, and being like, your authors did yeah, this, your yeah. authors that's did that. That's the thing that bothers me the yeah. most these days. You yeah. know, you get pig piled on Twitter and mm -hmm. all of a sudden everybody is emailing the publisher about something yeah. the publisher had nothing to do with it. Yeah, yeah. so th yeah. that's why I kind of like try to filter that out before it try. Before it's like it he began. was driving a <laughs> Ford when he ran into all those people. Right, so, yeah. so, so Ford. So manufacturing plant should be shut down. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just oh, I do, I have one instance. Oh, I have a one star review, right? So I, you have a magazine, right? So I might have five reviews over all like what, 40 issues, right? But one of them is this, this scathing one star review on one of the issues that has nothing to do with the issue has to do with the fact that one of my writers ordered something used off of eBay. No. <laughs> and then the writer and the person got into this huge tiff because the thing wasn't right or they, I don't even know what it was about. So the, the eBay person Googled him, found out he had he'd been in my magazine, Gosh. went out and wrote like this, and it, it sounds like they've read it, but it, they really haven't read it at all, right? And you could report that thing. I report it once every, you know, six or eight months at this point to Amazon, and they, and they don't care, mm -hmm. right? But so, if it's your brother. Hmm? If it's your brother. Oh, yeah. That's, maybe that's what I should tell, tell them. Your brother. This yeah. is the mother of the author. Um, and so, <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, every once in a while I look at that, right, and it's just... Like, oh, look, there's my one-star issue because, you know, Victor got into a fight over, like, a sprinkler or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, not on my press, and it was before I was even publishing. I used to um, go to conventions and stuff, and people would do readings. I would record the readings. I would had a YouTube channel. And I've had readers at the time that were coming and be like, yeah, I can't go to this convention, but I want to see this author read from this book that I just bought. Um, so it was kind of, uh, you know, great for... The, the people who were coming there to watch the authors read. Um, and then one day, I got a comment that was uh, very, it was just a personal attack on the author oh, that I knew as a friend. So I'm, you know, I'm not a publisher at the time, but I'm just like getting a hold of this author. I'm like, uh, you need to come over, like, I'm going to block this comment. But like, yeah, and it was, uh, yeah, it was uh, his um, girlfriend's ex who d decided to go across all media <laughs> just looking for this guy, leaving these just outrageous reviews on Amazon, Goodreads, uh, YouTube, wherever they could find him. They were putting these awful, awful uh, personal attacks on this guy. And it's just like, yeah, that's the kind of thing you don't want to happen. <laughs> that kind of segues into a good thing for publishers to mention, though. Um, reviews are like gold standard now. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have got to find ways to get reviews, and it, it's so hard. I mean, the, the authors, and you can go to your social media and give away copies and give away 50 copies, get two reviews. 
Mm-hmm. But if you don't get the reviews, you can't get promotion, and if you can't get the promotion, you can't sell the books. Mm-hmm. Um, we got a negative review on an ebook that said it smelled like cigarette smoke. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are we are unfortunately out of time, but I'm telling everybody find these people this weekend, pick their brains, talk to them, buy their books, and. Uh, just generally, if, if you have any more questions or anything else, we could probably do this for about five hours. Yeah. <laughs> so if you have any other questions, you know, stop them and uh, stop them in the bathroom and just start talking to them. They love it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, and one more time, thanks to this week's sponsors, AdamandEve.com, America's number one trusted source for everything in the bedroom. They've got stuff for her, stuff for him, stuff for couples, movies, massage oils, lingerie, vibrators, bondage gear, and so much more. Remember, at checkout, enter that offer code, KEEN, K-E-E-N-E, get 10 free tantalizing gifts when you do that. Uh, Important to remember that it is discreet shipping. It comes in a very plain box. It's not going to say, sex toys. Sex toys. Your dirty, dirty sex toys. Sex toys are us. <laughs> so again, the that, UPS guy yells that out when he delivers the package. Adam and Eve. <laughs> You're singing a baseball game. Yeah. Get your sex <laughs> toys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on down. Fresh, hot sex toys. He's got like an air horn. <laughs> <laughs> and one more time, I want to remind folks... <laughs> When Mary's done giggling about that abandoned building in northern New Jersey Woo! that has it is a northern, haunted it is New Jersey, is yeah, it abandoned building, yeah, it's the whole yeah, place, the whole right? place. Northern yeah. New Jersey it has a rich haunted history of ghosts, yes, it does, demons, monsters of all kinds. Yes. It was once an asylum for the criminally insane, a craft brewery, I live there. and most recently a decrepit <laughs> eyesore that should have been demolished years ago. I think the same can be said of all of Jersey. Exactly. Should yes. have been demolished yes. years right. ago. I agree. First, all of you bite me. A Secondly. place where evil dwells, <laughs> yes. San Giovanni, a venue that feeds on the souls of all who enter. Wait, is that just the smell? You know what? <laughs> all of you can bite me. That's... Beers and Fears, The Haunted Brewery, <laughs> a new book consisting of four, four interconnected novellas by Chuck Puda, Frank Edler, Tim Meyer, and Armand Rose Amelia. Beers and Fears, The Haunted Brewery, available right now on Amazon and also Kindle Unlimited. We thank both of them for sponsoring this week's show. If you would like to sponsor a show, there's an easy way to do that. What you want to do is you want to go to projectentertainmentnetwork.com, click contact, and let our boss know, hey, I would like to waste my money having Mary <laughs> giggle through my ad as well. Um, and we will hook you up with that. Um, Dave, we're yes. all pulling for you. Thank we you. hope you'll be here next week. You know who else will be here next week? No. Asher Ellis. Asher Ellis will be joining us here. Oh, wow. Um, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, a I'll, reminder I'll, I'll that our <laughs> John will what's, be that? what's that, John? I'll be here too. Right. He'll be here too. John will be here too, um, and, he, and he will say, "I'm John Urbansick." No, I'm John Urbansick. No, no, I'm John Urbansick. No. I'm John Urbansick. No. Okay, Mary, close your eyes. Okay. Now I'm gonna have to go over here next to John. So hang on. Now, Mary. Because yeah, of the voices over He's here. got his shirt on now, so it's yeah. okay. Mary, no, close your eyes. Okay. Now, now you and I, we frequent adamandeve.com. Of course. We even use my last name as the offer code. But let's see how well you really know me. Okay. John's going to say, I'm John Urban Sick. I'm going to say, I'm John Urban Sick. But you're going to tell us which one is which. Okay. I'm John Urban Sick. I'm John Urban Sick. First one's Brian, second one's John. Was she right, Matt? Yeah, okay. Well, that, bomb, <laughs> that bomb, but I'm sure Asher Ellis is you, interview you, will be. You win, right. you win 10 prizes if you order now. That's right. <laughs> 10 free tantalizing gifts. Mary, close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm John Urbansick. <laughs> and on that note, we'll see you next week, folks. Bye. Uh... 
There Shall Come a Podcast, a podcast like no other. Defenders Dialogue. Marvel Comics' original superhero non-team convenes once again. Comic book writers and authors Brian Keane and Christopher Golden take us back to the 70s and 80s as they discuss Marvel's most dynamic collection of superheroes. Defenders Dialogue with Brian Keane and Christopher Golden. Tuesdays exclusively on Project Entertainment Network.